Well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. And welcome to the AbleNet University series on the quality indicators for assistive technology. We are here today continuing a discussion about the quality indicators for assistive technology. We want to thank you for joining us, and I want to remind you that ReadyTalk will be addressing any technical issues that may arise. Since this is the fourth in a series of webinars on the quality indicators, we're not going to go into a lot of history, but if you are new to QUIET, I want to encourage you to please go to the website after today's webinar to get more information. So let's begin. My name is Susan McCloskey. I'm a speech-language pathologist who has worked in education for many years. I've been a school speech therapist, a local assistive technology specialist, and a state-level technical service provider in the area of assistive technology for the projects known in Pennsylvania as the Assistive Device Center and PATAN. Currently, I'm the department chair for Volusia County's assistive technology team here in Florida. We have a district of about 70,000 students, and on my team we have four speech-language pathologists, two occupational therapists who work with us part-time, one teacher of the visually impaired who works with us on a part-time basis, and two incredible office specialists who work with and support us. One of them has production responsibilities for the vast number of visual supports that we recommend and implement throughout the district. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Terry. Good morning or good afternoon, as Susan said. My name is Terry Foss. And I'm a special education teacher by certification and licensure. I have a master's in education with emphasis in the low incidence population and license in elementary education and mild to severe special education from elementary through high school. I have experience teaching students with intellectual disabilities, autism, multiple and severe disabilities, and for the last couple of mm, decades, I have been an AT resource specialist in a suburban school district in the Midwest of about 28,000 students. My district's team consists of two special educators and two SLPs. We also have the support of one office man manager, and she is in charge of the AT inventory. I'm also co-author with Jane Corston of the Every Move Counts, Clicks, and Chats manual. And now we'd like to talk a little bit about some of the AbleNet um, details that they'd like us to share with you. So if you'd read your screen, we would appreciate that. And please know that you will receive a follow-up email after today's session where you will find several links that will enable you to, load, to download a link to the presentation slides if you don't already have them and get your certific certificate of attendance. And if you'd like to share a recording of today's session, it will be available through a link on the AbleNet University webpage. So one of the first things we'd like to do today is take a poll. So we've shared our background with you as an SLP and a special educator, and now we'd like to ask you to participate and share your backgrounds and perspectives. So if you would just click on the appropriate uh, circle beside your um, role, we would very much appreciate that. Wow, everyone's doing a great job. I see a lot of responses coming in. They're getting a lot of responses. This is great. And I wish I knew who the other was. We've got a lot of others. <laughs> we do have a lot of others. It's really interesting seeing this. Okay. Well, we have about 79 responses in, so we're going to move along. Okay. Sounds great. And, can, and I'm assuming everyone can see the results. We have a majority of speech-language pathologists, 
followed by a big group of other and OTs and PTs. Yeah, okay. a very large number of OTs and PTs. That's great. Mm-hmm. And special educators are in there. Yeah, wonderful. Okay. I think we'll move on to the next slide. This slide you'll see an example of, or the list of all the quality indicators on the Quiet website. And um, today we want to discuss including AT in the IEP. The IEP, as we know, drives the implementation of the needed assistive technology by documenting what works, what is needed, and sometimes <laughs> what doesn't work. It documents equipment and or services to be implemented or provided. This is the vehicle for getting all of the team on the same page. The Individuals with Disability and Education Act, IDEA, requires IEP teams to consider a student's need for AT. In order to be effective, the team must also document decisions that are made about what the student's needs for AT devices and services are. These indicators guide the team in writing IEPs for individual students and may offer an agency suggestions for the discussion topics to provide educators about including AT in the IEP for in-servicing. We have another poll now, and we'd just like to know a little bit about your familiarity with all of the quiet indicators. And so, again, if you'd take a minute to um, fill in the bubble about your level of understanding or familiarity with the quiet indicators, we would certainly appreciate it. Well, again, we appreciate your participation. It looks like all these responses are coming in really well. We certainly do. We have a nice high level of response here. We're glad so many of you have heard of them. And we're, we're hoping we'll give you a few reasons why you might find them something that you want to use on a regular basis. How are we doing it? We're doing really well on numbers. Yes, we are. We've got just about mm -hmm. everybody in there. And again, mm -hmm. the barcode there, that's wonderful. All right, we're that's, going to continue. Absolutely. All right, here we are at indicator number one. The education agency has guidelines for documenting assistive technology needs in the IEP and requires their consistent application. So this indicator is all about having guidelines, and in some ways we can also relate this to professional development, or I do anyway. IDEA does not specify where or how assistive technology is to be included in the IEP. It gives suggestions. Since the IEP drives the process for service delivery, it's important to make sure there is enough detail in the IEP so that all staff know what is supposed to happen, what is supposed to be provided. The guiding document on including assistive te technology in the IEP can be found on the QUIET website, and it includes several key questions. Does the agency have clearly written guidelines for documenting assistive technology in the IEP? Are the guidelines system systematically disseminated? Are the guidelines consistently implemented? Has a person been designated to provide support and guidance in addressing the guidelines and their implementation. This is where I think the professional development aspect comes in. For example, in my district, our FIDLERS, which is an acronym for the Florida Diagnostic and Learning Resource System, the tech staff person from that project and myself provide the training for our district placement staff. Those are the folks who need to be knowledgeable about this at the actual IEP meeting. We also have information about assistive technology in the teacher handbook, and the AT team referral paperwork is available to all teachers and staff on the county website. Now, Terry's going to take you through the matrix. Well, 
I'll give you just a couple minutes, to, not, well, not minutes, but a couple seconds to familiarize yourself with this screen. You've probably already seen this type of matrix if you've joined us for previous quiet webinars. Uh, previously, we've talked about consideration and assessment. This matrix is formatted using a rating scale of 1 to 5, with 1 being unacceptable and 5 being promising practice. This matrix is intended to help individuals, teams, schools, and agencies reflect on the current status, possibly provide an intervention, and then measure change. Number one means no guidelines exist. Number two, guidelines exist, but the IEP team is not aware of them. Three, guidelines exist, but only some of the members are aware. Four, there are guidelines and most. IEP team members are aware, and five, everyone knows all of the guidelines. If, for example, in my setting, some training has taken place to inform some potential IEP team members. AT is considered at each IEP, and if AT is identified as needed, a member of the AT team is probably in attendance and helps guide the documentation. Susan? Number two, indicator number two. Yes, we'll move to indicator number two. And I just want to remind you, again, in previous uh, webinars on the quality indicators, there was some discussion about using these indicators mm -hmm. and the matrix, especially as a self-assessment tool. So I think you can see as you work through those numbers one to five, it'll be a really good way to see where you are as an AT team, as a school building, as a district, uh, as an entity, you know, whatever you are. All right, so let's move on to indicator, num or, yeah, indicator number two. All services that the IEP team determines are needed to support the selection, acquisition, and use of assistive technology devices are designated in the IEP. This indicator is a very powerful one, and it covers a lot of issues. The services identified in IDEA that focus on assistive technology move all the way from the selection of the appropriate technology to the implementation of that technology. As you read the intent statement, you can see that the services are all focused on what is needed to make the student successful. They're talking about things that are critical to the effective use of assistive technology devices. A district might ensure that an assistive technology assessment will be completed by writing that in the special factors areas of the IEP once the IEP team has determined that it is needed through the consideration process. They may document that training needs to occur in the supports for school personnel section of the IEP, and the technology may be listed or described in the present levels and or the supplementary aids and services section. We'll move on to the matrix. And once again, we have our one through five rating scale. We'd like to see that the documentation is included and that it includes sufficient information to support effective implementation, as is stated at the uh, point of number five there. All right, now I'm going to pass this back to Terry, and we're going to get you all involved in another poll. Yes, one more poll. Let's take a minute to get some feedback from all of you about where you document ATE in the IEP. So please fill out this poll. Do you document it in special ed, goals and objectives, related services, supplementary aids and services, or, or maybe you don't know? Oh, again, people are doing a great job with these polls today. Yeah, we really appreciate the feedback, and I think um, other participants appreciate seeing this, too. That's very interesting. Supplementary aids and services is coming out a winner. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> okay, I don't think we're going to get... Okay. Very Too good. Change there. But again, a really nice, nice um, level of response. Um, I want you to um, 
look at the screen, and there's a sample here. I'm going to refer to Stella a few times throughout this webinar. But first, um, let's talk just a minute about under federal law, AT may be included in any of those categories that we listed previously, special ed related services, supplementary aids and services. And um, it's up to the IEP team to decide where. Each area is equally powerful. Okay, this is an example of a service page for a young lady named Stella. And this page actually includes all of the services, special ed, which is specially designed instruction, related services, which are services related, which are services required to assist the student to benefit from special ed and supplementary aids and services, which are services that enable the student to be educated with non-exceptional peers. In this example, the AT services are listed as indirect consultation for 30 minutes monthly. Services listed in this way may be provided through student observation and consultation with the student, with the family, perhaps the resource teacher, the paras, the OT, and or the SLP. It could also include review and analysis of data to determine if any changes in strategy needs to be adjusted. These observations and consultations may result in implementation changes, customization, and or maintenance of the AT device. Any number of things could take place as these things are evaluated. Okay. Another slide about program modifications. This is an example taken again from Stella's IEP. This is the mod program modification accommodations supplementary aids for students and supports for school personnel page of her IEP. In this case, where the green arrow is, continue to model refers to previous in services which were provided to staff regarding the use of her AT communication system. Modeling communication between Stella and her communication partners is encouraged throughout the day, and printed icon sequences of the device language are available for both the staff and for Stella. Susan? Okay. We're going to talk a little bit. Um, there's some questions coming in that I'm reading in the chat box. That was the oh, reason oh, very for the pause. Good. I'm, let's get through this, and then I want to go back to some of the, the questions and comments that came in um, after that last poll. Okay, great. Um, but for, for right now, let's talk about uh, another area that needs to be documented is uh, regarding assistive technology is standardized testing. It's important to review state and local guidelines for accommodations for testing. This is going to be different in so many different places. For the most part, though, the rule of thumb is that the assistive technology must be used for testing on a regular basis throughout the school year, and that's very important in order to be able to use during state or district-wide testing. I wanted to uh, share an example a student who I was working with, uh, Sam, is a fifth grader, he wasn't really using any high-tech devices for testing. He used assistive technology. He was reading digital text on an iPad. He had tools that he used for writing, but, that was, but they weren't used for the statewide assessment. However, we included very clear statements in his IEP about how he used low-tech solutions to accommodate his tremors in order to justify a request for a one-test-item-per-page unique accommodation so that he could see everything without having to turn pages. Um, I'm going to just refer to the example the way it's written on the slide. You know, Sam uses page ups and a book stand during test taking in the classroom so that he can independently have access to all of the pages of the test. This is necessary due to his tremors that prevent him from turning test pages. This was a wonderful accommodation that was actually uh, it, it, it was kind of decided upon and, and came upon by his uh, general education teacher. And she came up with this after I had taken some page ups into the classroom. It was just wonderful. Um, the test packet was delivered when, when our Florida FCAT came. It was delivered as all separate pages that could be positioned so that he could see four pages at a time. We put one page in a page up, and then we had two on a book stand, and we had another on another page up. That way he could read the text, read the questions, 
and then go back and read the text again, just as other students do who are able to flip, you know, back and forth in the test booklets. The page ups in the book stand were a great way for him to be independent. So don't forget to document low tech solutions and make sure that the present levels indicate that the student uses those supports on a regular basis in the classroom. Well, Susan, what a great example of no batteries and no electricity. Exactly. You know, and he yeah, did AC. He, said he had other high tech items, but uh, this is really mm -hmm. what got him through testing. Sure. Um, I want to go back to just some of the comments that were made uh, regarding the poll. We asked you to pick just one. We didn't put in an all of the above because we thought, well, well let's just get, you know, where we are in terms of the most common place where people are, are documenting assistive technology in the IEP. And we had a couple of uh, comments from people saying that they have sections in their IEP that weren't listed in the poll, you know, and that's perfectly fine. You know, there are certain sections of the IEP that are mandated by federal law, and then you can add others to your local format. So that's, that's usually not a problem. There was also a question about how is it indicated who would be doing that service? Or is it open to any team member? Well, again, I think on the format or the form that you're using on your services page, there's usually a place where that can be addressed. And it will say either classroom teacher or classroom teacher and, you know, speech language clinician, you know, whatever it might be. I know the way we do it is on our services page, and, and typically it would be he's going to use it in small group settings, he's going to use it in large group settings, he's going to use it when he's, you know, on the campus. So that's a, that's a great question to bring up. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Let's move on to the third indicator. And this is about the IEP illustrating that assistive technology is a tool to support achievement of goals and progress in the general curriculum by establishing a clear relationship between student needs, the assistive technology devices and services, and the student's goals and objectives. So during both the consideration and the assessment process, the IEP team will be determining which, with which goals the student may need assistive technology support. On our district assistive technology assessment form, we actually have an area where the goals and the objectives that the assistive technology will support are documented. Let's take a look at the matrix. What we hope to see is that clear relationship, as stated in the indicator, between the student's needs, the AT, and the student's goals and objectives. So we've got everything from number one, where there's no linkage, all the way to being consistently linked to the goals and objectives and the general curriculum. I have another story. So, Susan. I need another hand here. I know. Um, I wanted to te tell you a little story about Katrina because this just happened. Katrina is a first grader with very unintelligible speech. Um, I was called in through our referral process to facilitate the assessment with the speech language pathologist and the classroom teacher. She's in a, a general education first grade. In the initial IEP, there was absolutely nothing to support the use of any type of a speech generating device. There were only articulation goals. But obviously, after the AT assessment and the trial period, when we decided to try to continue the use of a voice output device, you know, throughout uh, the rest of the school year, we reconvened the IEP team and added goals with a focus on communication interaction repair, as you can see from the examples on the slide. I'm not going to read them all to you. But we did need to reconvene that IEP team and, uh, and meet with the family again. And that's actually very important because it was a nice opportunity to be able to talk to the parents and, you know, provide a quick training and, uh, you know, make plans for additional trainings and things like that. All right, now I'm going to pass it back to Terry. Okay. We are now on indicator number four, and this one talks specifically about measurable and observable outcomes. So this one says IEP content regarding assistive technology use is written in language that describes how assistive technology contributes to achievement of measurable and observable outcomes. This is an indicator where I spend most of my time with my colleagues. 
to find just the right language to describe the plan and the expected outcomes. So everyone involved with the implementation understands exactly what is to be expected. It really, really is challenging to describe exactly and accurately how AT will contribute to the student's achievement. And a couple of key questions that you might consider when you're trying to write measurable and observable outcomes might be, did the team describe expected results in achievement? Did they have clear ways to measure changes in student achievement? So just, you know, do they describe what they expect to see change, and then did they describe ways to measure those changes? Did the team determine meaningful criteria for success? That's always kind of a challenging one um, in our setting because there's some district standards that um, people try to write um, so they're sort of similar across the board, but sometimes, you know, our kiddos just don't fit quite into those boxes. So now if we take a minute to look at the matrix for indicator four about measurable and observable outcomes. Number one refers to IEP to the IEP that does not describe outcomes of AP at all. And number two, the outcomes are described, but they're not measurable. Number three, there are some outcomes that are measurable. And four, it's getting better. And five says it all, where the descriptions are observable and measurable, and everyone on board understands exactly what's expected. When it comes to measuring, I think um, when it comes to measuring, if you have a product, a finished product to measure, and it's it's really a lot easier because you can measure quantity and quality and those kinds of things. But when it comes to measuring through observations, those are a little more tricky, and you might want to consider changes in speed, accuracy, spontaneity, duration, and latency. Any of these variables could influence the effectiveness or the efficiency of AT. And really, for more information about those measurement systems, I encourage you to um, check out the book, How Do You Know It and How Do You Show It, by Penny Reed, Gail Bowser, and Jane Corston. Okay, Susan, I think you have some good examples of um, measurable and observable outcomes. Okay. Before I move on to those examples, though, just so we don't get too far from where some of these questions are that are coming in, we have oh, a question about you, where yeah. do you put training of the gen ed teachers and the use of things like text-to-speech or speech-to-text? That supports for school personnel is a great place to put anything that has to do with training. I've been doing that since I started in the field of assistive technology way back in Pennsylvania. And I think it's a really underused section of the IEP. So make sure it's there on your IEP formats, and uh, I would I would put it in there. Very good. Um, and sometimes I um, include details like that, possibly within the PLEP, within the um, present level of performance. That's another spot you can be a little more descriptive. Okay. All right. So we are moving to some examples about observable and measurable. And this is a one that came from a little boy, Grayson, who is, happens to be a target student in our ECT, our Environmental Communication Teaching Training Series this year. And again, the focus for him was on initiated communication. And we simply said we wanted to initiate communicative interactions for requests, negations, or questions using a speech generating device during two targeted activities for five times each school day for two consecutive weeks. This can all be counted, you know, and that's what we're going for. It's something functional, it's something he needs to do, and it's something that we can definitely count and get a handle on. I have another example here. This is an example about a high school student, Amaya. Her team was trying to build a lot of independence in multiple task use by her of her assistive technology. So we simply added, Amaya will navigate from her AAC app to her writing app on a mobile tablet 
to respond to assignments or writing prompts twice per class period for three periods a day for four consecutive weeks. So, two examples there. And there are some questions coming mm -hmm. in. Let me just uh, see what we have here. Do you have to have an AT eval for a student if you just want to add text to speech for students that do not decode well? Or can you just write it in the IEP to get the software? I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question. Um, my gut and I, and tells I think, me that if this is something yeah. the student needs, I would certainly want to have it documented in the student's IEP. If you and have resources available in your district, as we do in ours, we have a lot of school-based teams who know that Read Out Loud is on every middle school and high school computer. Write Out Loud is on every elementary school computer, or it can be. It can, it's, it's a push-in model. No problem, no limitations. If they want the student to be using that, they and they know that's what the student would benefit from, they can go ahead and implement that without having a formal assistive technology evaluation. But again, I believe it should be documented in that student's IEP. As he moves to the next setting, let's say he's articulating from elementary to middle school or middle school to high school, I would want to make sure that that information has been captured. And another question about how do you decide if assistive technology should be used at all? All right, I'm going to refer you back to the archived webinar, webinars on assistive technology consideration and assistive technology assessment because that question is a little bit beyond the scope of this particular webinar. And then another question coming in about how would you state the supports for school personnel in the IEP. And again, what I've done in, in my personal experience is simply state that a training will be set up for the classroom teacher, the classroom paraprofessional. I mean, you know, it, it usually ends up being me or someone on the assistive technology team that's going to go in and do those trainings. We also do a lot of building-wide trainings in my county. And, uh, you know, we might make a statement like that, you know, because we know that our Fiddler's Tech person will be doing trainings on Read Out Loud, will be doing trainings on Write Out Loud, and all of those trainings are advertised on the website, so people have a way to get that. Yeah, and um, I another question coming in. Boy, we're getting a lot of questions here. Terry, I'm sorry. Here, we're interrupting our no. flow a little bit. You Should every right student on an IEP have an AT eval? Well, what the law says, and this is for, for Scott, what the law says is that every student, when you have your IEP meeting, every student who has an IEP meeting needs to be considered for assistive technology. Or I should say it the other way around. Assistive technology should be considered for every student. And uh, again, there's a wonderful webinar on consideration. Oh, Sheila sent something in here that's a very long, long chat. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps while you read that, I might add to that. Um, Go ahead. Good idea. About sh should every student have an IEP, have AT on the IEP reeval? Re I think that's one of those questions that can be answered with the famous "it depends" answer. Um, that might possibly be specific to the agency. I know that sometimes um, things can be added at IEP meetings, and in some agencies, things cannot be added without um, possibly a reeval. And I know that it would be dependent upon your data and upon um, what's recorded perhaps in the present level performance. So again, that answer may well be it depends. Susan, did okay. that Thank you, Terry. question read? Yeah, um, Sheila, uh, Kelly, I read your chat and we're actually going to touch on that if you want to uh, hold on for just a moment. We're going to get into the whole issue of describing AT specifically in the IEP because that is part of indicator number five. And let's see if we answer your question enough at that point in time. Um, and I'm, I may come back to your chat, so Gloria, don't, don't move it yet. All right, thanks. And another comment um, from Tricia that they used to have a program on every computer and then things changed in the district and 
It has to be on the IEP now to get it on a flash drive. So, again, I think, you know, the whole point of an IEP is that it is almost a contract about what needs to be provided for a student. So if it's something that the student needs to have available to them, that's where it should be written down. Okay. Let's move on here. All right. Let's move on to indicator number five. This indicator is stated as follows. Assistive technology is included in the IEP in a manner that provides a clear and complete description of the devices and services to be provided and used to address student needs and achieve expected results. You know, we, we kind of keep saying this is critical, this is important, this is a powerful indicator. Um, they all are, but this one is, um, again, critical because it addresses the importance of describing exactly what the student is doing with the AT and what are the necessary features of that AT and or what services are necessary to support the AT that have been provided. And these are all kinds of things that we've heard some questions about, so hopefully in the next um, little bit here we'll be able to clear some of that up. So including clear and complete details in the IEP will save miscommunications regarding outcome expectations for the student. It will save um, miscommunications for individual team members of the existing team and clear and um, complete descriptions are also wonderful in terms of the receiving team in a transition. So if we move to the uh, matrix, Again, you see the one unacceptable and five as um, promising practice. Descriptions of the devices and services sure do help the IEP team stay on the same page. Number one on the scale does not include any description on the IEP. Number two includes the devices and services that may not support the use. Um, remember, the mo remember that modeling component in the example I gave you. The modeling was intended to support the AT use. Um, the third on the sliding scale here describes some documentation and some support for AT use. Number four describes adequate AT, while number five describes promising practice as documented and adequate and consistent. So I'm going to go back to another example of Stella's IEP. Her IEP, or her PLEP, and I was referring to this a little bit earlier, her PLEP currently reads, Stella typically responds verbally but is unintelligible without context. She also uses a dynamic screen VOCA with 84 messages. In parentheses, we write accent 1000 with Unity 84. She has progressed through the Vantage and the Vantage Lite. When she's presented with a story, using the Unique Learning Systems curriculum in a printed book paired with Unity icon sequences. She will read the story by activating the appropriate sequence. She is also able to progress through the same story in talking PowerPoint using a switch to advance the slides. She then answers um, comprehension questions when given answers in a field of five. And she does that with 72% accuracy. So that's included in the IEP. It's just not in one of the um, uh, places that we've talked about earlier today. So, Susan, if you move on to the next slide, I, I will... Checking my phone okay. because I was hearing beeps. I thought the battery was going. Okay. Oh, dear. Okay. No, this is another example and uh, of Stella's work, and this is based on that PLEP that I just shared with you. When Stella starts a new story, she starts with vocabulary words paired with the ULS icons, which are also paired with Unity icons. She practices verbally and with her device. So I'm just trying to give you an example of um, the words within the PEP and then what is actually happening. And, I, and hopefully the description is clear and complete. Okay, next slide, please. In this example, this is a picture of Stella with her device beside her book. And so after she practices the vocabulary, it becomes familiar with the vocabulary and any additional lessons that might accompany the unit. 
Stella typically reads the book verbally as she activates her device. She's supported with those. She's supported with um, Unity icon sequences. And you know she's really proud of her work and she loves to read to others. And I think this is, again, um, another example of how the AT support with the printed icons and, and with the modeling from um, others in her environment uh, really help support that AT. Okay, the next slide is an example of Stella answering comprehension questions re about her reading. She manually selects the answers and places it on the sentence strip, which you see over there on the right, and she typically pairs those movements with verbal answers. Then she is instructed to go to her device and provide the answer on her device. Usually that instruction isn't really necessary because she does like to use her device along with all of her reading projects. And notice at this point, icon sequences are no longer present. She's worked on it enough and practiced enough that um, you know, she's becoming pretty independent with that. So now her goal, based on that plaque we went over and based on some of the examples you'll, you see, her goal is after instruction and practice on a story, and I have ULS in parentheses, Stella will answer comprehension questions related to the instruction independently and intelligibly using her voice or communication device when presented with a field of five answers, which are ULS icons paired with text with 80% accuracy. So you see this is where you can include some of the details um, about some brand names and um, some curriculum, specific curriculum that you're using. And Susan's going to talk about that actual um, process of naming AT and the IEP. Okay, and Carrie, those are great examples, mm -hmm. again, showing the depth that's involved in terms of describing what's going on with this student and making sure that that's all very, very clear in the IEP. And what a wonderful segue. We've got about six questions in the chat box that all mm -hmm. pretty much have to do with this issue, um, which is what we're calling naming AT in the IEP. There's often a concern mm -hmm. about whether or not to name the actual assistive technology device in the IEP. And actually, there's very little guidance from IDEA on that matter. Um, but you need to remember that a statement in a present level of educational performance is, simply states what is currently being used. Often, in addition to naming a device or naming a software product, it's a good idea to describe the features that are helpful for that particular student. In that way, a team would be able to substitute a similar device that met the needs of the student by having the same features. Should something become broken or something become unavailable or, you know, something all of a sudden changes? And, and I think that's, you know, something that you want to think about. There's an example on the slide about Clio requiring the use of a word prediction program to assist her in completing classroom writing assignments. She's been successfully using Help Me Write, Write on the classroom computer, you know, as a, a present level statement. Or for the last six years, Jeff's been creating novel utterances of five to seven words as well as retrieving pre-stored familiar messages frequently and spontaneously throughout the day and across environments and listeners. Jeff has been successfully using an XYZ communicator to communicate his wants, needs, and information. Again, those are present level statements. There's another example. And these would be examples of how we might want to approach it by just describing features and not naming the device or not naming the software program. So here you have John exhibiting a severe expressive communication impairment. He communicates with peers and adults within his environment using vocalizations and an eight location, eight level voice output communication device using direct selection. That's pretty specific. And then it goes on to talk about how he's using it, you know, with specific vocabulary or, you know, that has something to do with eight settings. And then we have another example of Susan with a significant visual impairment, not able to access standard print instructional materials such as textbooks, worksheets, written tests. And it goes on to say that she's using a computer-based materials um, being enlarged using a text enlargement software application. It's not naming it, but it's certainly describing what's going to be useful for this particular student. So again, I don't think there's any right or wrong. I'm sure some of your local agencies are giving you some direction in terms of which way to go. 
but as I said, there really isn't a lot in the federal law that talks about that. So I think you have to, I think you have to try to accomplish two purposes. Number one, you know, we're encouraging people through the quality indicators to be as complete as possible and describe what's necessary for the student to make the student successful. And number two, you do want to be careful that you don't get into a situation where someone's saying, well, you said you have to have this and, you know, so go ahead and include that description and that might, uh, that might be enough to get you out of a hot seat every once in a while. All right, we're, we're coming up to uh, our last poll, I believe. We've been through the five indicators, so we want you to take a look at this and which one do you feel would be the most important to focus on in order to improve documentation of assistive technology in the IEP in your setting? So we're asking you to pick just one. If you had an opportunity to do some professional development, which do you think of after going through indicators one, two, three, four, and five in this area? You know, which ones do you think, which one do you think would make a difference in your particular setting? I'm going to show the results here as they come in. Wow, that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Very oh, interesting. It's changing quickly. <laughs> Purple still wins. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm assuming everybody can see this just like we can. <laughs> it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. We have 112 webinar participants today. And again, we want to thank you all for participating. And we've got about 80 responses in right now, so we'll give it another minute. But it definitely looks like this whole issue of um, some improvements in the area of clearly describing services in the IEP is something that a lot of you think mm -hmm. you might need to tackle. And that's great because, you know, in, in some ways that's really going to make uh, the biggest difference to a particular student. All right, Terry, shall we move on? Yes, I think that we've got a wonderful um, response from everyone, and we appreciate that. And it looks like services uh, rules the day with this group. Okay. Okay, a little food for thought. Now, if you've got the handout um, from... Gloria, earlier, your your printed version of this is going to look a little bit different than ours. We made a last-minute change and some grammatical corrections. So um, uh, I, I apologize for that. In fact, this is the original screen, actually, so the changes didn't make it in. Anyway, um, there is actually so much in the detail when we come to this food for thought, and we want you to ask yourself, really, would a person... Reading the IEP, be able to determine what kind of services, and, and that's where you were all concerned, and would they be able to determine exactly what features in the device would be important? Um, and is there a clear link between the use of AT and the student's curricular demands? And I think that one, that clear link, it goes across uh, goals and objectives and the actual student curriculum. And I might add here, um, when I mention the actual name of the curriculum in those goals, that curriculum is provided by our school district for that age level. And so that was a safe bet there. Um, if you noticed that the word unity was not included in the actual goal, but it was included in the, um, in the PLEP. So that's what she, the Stella is actually using at this time. And, you know, we want to be careful, um, when we're talking about this, about the complex systems, and be sure that we're talking about features, and Susan spoke to that very clearly. And um, be sure that we use language anyone can relate to. Otherwise, it's not that clear. Okay, let's talk about the key takeaways that we hope that you are leaving with today. And so, you know, first of all, teams need to know how they are to document according to their agency's guidelines. We spoke a little bit about that today. Um, there are certain uh, requirements but from the federal government, but then agencies are also um, certainly allowed to make their own adjustments on how things are recorded. Um, of course, IEPs are developed to address the unique needs of each individual AT, and AT is always related to a goal. Descriptions of AT, whether a device and or a service, 
need to be clear to everyone on the team, everyone, from students, parents, uh, all the uh, related service providers, resource, regular ed, everyone. And those outcomes must be measurable and observable. Otherwise, how can you prove anything and how can you make reasonable changes? As we've said before, the IEP is a powerful document if we include the details. Okay, the next slide. Well, I think we're going to go back to our chat questions for just a minute, Terry, mm -hmm. if you don't mind, sure. and then we'll get into resources. Because I just Absolutely. wanted to, um, Andrea sent in a comment saying, she almost feels that the AT decision needs to be stated in much the same way that we list the FAPE setting. Uh, we mm -hmm. almost need to list two or three things that were considered and then explain why we chose what we chose. That's really interesting um, because really in my mind, that's the kind of thing that has to happen during consideration moving on into assessment, you know, if you're talking about very specific mm -hmm. products by the time you get into assessment. But um, I, I know that there are a lot of agencies um, from talking to other assistive technology people across the country and certainly even in, in the state of Florida in different counties where we don't feel that we have enough documentation of consideration. But again, for those of you who are grappling with, you know, when do we say this, when do we do that, uh, you know, when do we make these decisions, go back and look at the archived webinars on consideration and assessment. And I also want to just check in with, uh, let's see, we had... Uh, Lisa put a comment in here, and I think you just addressed that about dealing with unity when you're talking about products like mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. Natalie, you had a comment that was the same kind of an issue, and Sheila Kelly, I'm going to go back to you. Um, Sheila had a had a question that really dealt with um, the fact that the district is encouraging her teachers to describe assistive technology specifically in the present levels and the mod modifications or support sections of the IEP. And she's saying that they try to focus on the skills rather than the device or the system in the IEP goals and objectives because they don't want it to seem as if the focus of the goals becomes the device rather than the skill we're teaching. Well, I think you have to think about that in two different ways. If you look back at the goal that I put in as an example of a measurable and observable goal on slide 21 with Grayson, we've got Grayson initiating communicative interactions for requests and negations, et cetera, using his speech-generating device. So this is a way where the focus is on the skill. You know, he needs to work on that initiating communication, but we're definitely looking at him doing it with his speech-generating device. There are going to be times, though, when you might actually have a goal in the IEP where the student needs to be able to demonstrate competency with their assistive technology. And so there may be one or two goals that really do focus on the actual technology itself, whether it's sort of learning something in a software program or doing something on a dedicated device or something on a computer. So, again, I think you have to balance that, but I think it's wonderful that you're thinking about that. Let me see. I'm just going to check the chat. Okay, I think we're a little bit caught up there. All right, so let's move on to resources, Terry. Okay, this is a screenshot of the resources page on the Quiet website, and um, you have all that information on every slide, so that should be in your handouts. Uh, the Quiet website is a wealth of information, and this resources page is shared by the Quiet community. These are things that people send in, and um, uh, based on acceptance, then they are posted. And when you go to the resource page, you'll see the introduction there at the top. And then in the lower part, you'll see a table on the lower part of the screenshot, which takes you to various resources that have been posted. And then when you look at the right side of the page, you'll see the link to take you through the process of submitting a document. And then there's some additional useful links. So, it's, like I said, it's a wealth of information on this uh, resources page of QUIET, and we encourage you to check that out after the webinar. I think Susan has a couple more. Yeah, there are some really great here. resources on here, and, of course, I didn't list them all, um, but there is the section on the website, the QUIET website, you know, where you can go and you can pull down lists of resources that kind of uh, address each of the areas that we have an assistive technology indicator in. Um, so we have them for consideration. We have them for assessment. We have them for including assistive technology in the IEP. 
Some of the resources on the website include the Assistive Technology Training Online Project from the University of Buffalo, the Georgia Project for Assistive Technology, and OSEP. There are a lot of nice tools on OSEP. I wanted to highlight on this slide our very own guiding document for including assistive technology in the IEP. I've used it in trainings. It's a great training document. And I also wanted to add something that I'm not sure everybody's familiar with, the assistive technology internet modules that are coming from the Ocali Project in Ohio. And they have a series of modules, and including one on documenting assistive technology in the IEP, that are very, very helpful. They're very well done. And, um, you know, we're using them for a lot of uh, professional development opportunities uh, in our county. And again, before we move on to the next slide, um, we're being asked where are the consideration of the assessments. And Tricia, are you asking about the webinars? All of these webinars that AbleNet University has been so kind to host for the quality indicator for assistive technology folks, um, they are going to be archived on the AbleNet website. And, of course, if you want to go back and look at the actual indicators on consideration and indicators on assessments, you need to go to the website. And we're going to look at that next. You know, again, um, Terry's kind of been through this page. But I uh, want to make sure if you have any, any information you want to ask the quiet leadership team, at the bottom left of the slide, you can see an email. It's a Gmail address where you can get in touch with us. And then on the right-hand side is the www.quiet.org. When you go to that site, and if you look at the top of the slide, you'll be able to see where it says indicators, and that's where all of the indicators and in all of the areas will be available to you. I do want to caution you that this um, screenshot was probably taken back in July and we have been doing some updates of the website. So the actual website may look a little bit different when, when you go there. And Terry, I'm going to pass it to you. Okay. We definitely want to share with you and invite you to uh, participate in the next quiet webinar hosted by AbleNet. And that is coming up on January 15th. It's going to be about AT implementation and will be presented by other members of the quiet leadership team, Gail Bowser and Jane Corston. Okay, and um, this is a good time if you have another couple of questions. We just have a few minutes. You could uh, key those in, but we do want you, we do want to thank you for joining us today, and we do want to remind you that when this is over, please keep your browser window open and a short survey will appear on your screen. And, and all of your opinions regarding these uh, webinars ma matter to AbleNet, so please take a moment to complete that survey. And um, just as uh, Susan's been reminding you, do go to the AbleNet website for information and schedules of other professional development offerings, and do go to the um, archived webinars because you can pick up the information that was, there was a webinar on introducing quiet and the consideration assessment, and shortly this one on including AT and the IEP will be available. So again, we want to thank you, and uh, we have just a couple minutes for a couple questions. So write them in that chat box, and um, we'll see what we can do to answer. Yeah, them. I'm checking the chat box, and uh, it looks like there's some chats going on that are specific to a particular family. And uh, other than that, um, I'm hoping, Natalie, that we've answered your questions. Tricia, we've answered your questions. They're still sitting in the chat box there. Um, a lot of people are writing and saying, yeah, their school system is, is, uh, is the same. That they're, they're asking them not to focus on the device itself. And, and that's fine, and, and yet, uh, you know, if we don't build some competency with the, with the technology, then the kids are, are often struggling on how they're supposed to use it. So, again, you have to find a balance there. Yeah, and, and I think when you're not brand naming the device, um, if you're specific with features, then, um, you know, those are the features that have to be addressed and, and the skills that have to be addressed. So you can get pretty specific with that kind of thing. Okay. Well, it looks like we've answered about 24 questions. I don't see any new ones coming in. So, again, thank you so much for your participation. This has just been a blast. 
And I've enjoyed working with Terry Foss way over in Kansas, and I want to thank Gloria Olson from AbleNet and Lena from ReadyTalk. This has been a wonderful meeting this afternoon, and uh, I'm going to sign off now. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>